Well, welcome back. I'm Mike Festiva. Since I've had this machine for the last six months or so, I've put about a thousand miles on it. But I have to say, finally, it's very dependable, something you can hop in and drive daily. Uh, I've had some carbon choke issues and some water leaks on it since I got the machine. So in this video, we install a new carb with the manual choke pull, install some turn signals up front, bend some bars for the bumper, do some exhaust work, retime it, change out all the cooling lines, do some aluminum welding and uh, fit a custom radiator in this thing. And at the end of the video, we do a little bit of off-roading with the key trucks. Stick around and enjoy the video. We're going to be tearing off this carburetor, the stock carb. The choke has never worked very well. Go into more detail about why later. And I ordered an aftermarket one with the manual choke pull, which I don't mind. I've dirt bikes for years. I don't mind pulling on a manual choke when it's cold. So, I'm going to start pulling this carburetor off. I had two reasons for taking this carb off. One, I actually want to switch it out with that other carb I just showed you. But I also want to switch out all the cooling lines on this machine. They're all old and uh, they've been leaking and causing me problems. So I'm popping off some cooling lines here and replacing them with a bunch of silicone lines. That thing had a water choke and an intake manifold heater for the edge of the carb. So I want to eliminate a bunch of these water lines down here. So under the carb, it had two of these plastic tees. And these are the kinds of things that leave you stranded on the side of the road. They're super thin wall plastic, old, probably brittle. Getting rid of one out of the system completely and replacing the other one with a brass tee should be a lot sturdier. Also, I have a wide range of silicone tubes. I got these from uh, eBay just because a lot of these hoses are all like specially pre bent and you're just not going to find those. So, this stuff flexes really well before it crinkles. Hey, Sasha, how are you doing? So I've been dealing with a pesky coolant leak, just a little drip here and there. And there's a little rubber hose that bounces between here to another line that came over to the edge of this little oil cooler above the oil filter. Pulled off the metal line here and pressure checked it. And it's actually a leak right underneath where this uh, hanger is brazed on. I usually just replace all that with silicone, but it goes up and around the drive shaft here. So I think I'm gonna cut it back to here and slide the silicone over that and jump this last little bit. Just another reason to replace every hose on this thing. I just have one other heater hose up here to replace and everything will be new. So up here we got some half inch hoses coming up to the heater core up in the front of the cab. Replaced this one this summer and ran out of tubing. Got some more half inch tubing. Gonna pull that clamp off there, place this hose. That should be the last of the rubber hoses and these are old, rotted out. So I'm glad to get them changed out. Final junk hose. Nice to get that out of there. So a few main reasons why I'm replacing this old carb. It's always had a little bit of a bog of just right off of idle. Never felt like the mixture is quite right, but it's a 30 year old carb. Someone buggered with the choke circuit so bad that it never worked right. And it's got a water choke. And finally I got to the point where I just wired it open all the time right over here at the zip tie. It looked very hard to actually modify it to make it a cable pull choke. Someone bent some tabs on here originally and messed with the linkage. So this carb actually had four water lines, two coming in and out of here to heat the choke circuit. And the biggest problem with this, it kind of is always a bugger to get it warmed up. And once you got to go wherever you're going, say you pulled into the hardware store, you went into the store for 15 minutes, this circuit would cool off. And by the time you come back out to the truck, the truck would still be warm, but the water choke would cool off. And it would basically start up and flood the engine every time. By wiring this off, it was a little hard to get it warmed up in the mornings for about five minutes. But after that, anytime you start it throughout the day and the vehicle's warm, not having the choke automatically come on was good. This one I bought is a cable pull manual choke. So I think that's gonna be a lot better. A few other things about this carb, it just looks like a little simpler, simpler vacuum system. This one has extra vacuum lines and it also had a manifold heater for not more water lines and this one doesn't. I think it's fine. We don't live in a very cold climate. So we're gonna try it out and hopefully it works. So being 30 years old, this truck has had a lot of people tinkering with it and messed up the choke circuit and misplaced vacuum lines. So this new carb is super simple. I only have one vacuum line going to the carburetor and that's for vacuum advance. One fuel inlet and one for return. Choke cable and throttle cable. So it's much easier to take this thing on and off for rejetting. So we're going to pull on the choke here, turn on the key, get some gas pump into the carb again and see how it runs. It's 
So the choke circuit worked great. Truck idled when it was cold, no problem, warmed up. But as soon as I took it for a test drive, I realized it was really lean. It was just sputtering and not running right. Lots of dead spots in the car. Throttle response was terrible. So we're pulling it back off again to play around with the jets and see if we can get it to run any better. I think that jet was around maybe a 95 or 100. I've got 110, probably try 120 in that main carb. Here's my old carb. Pulled out some of the jets in here. I think if you bought one of these carbs, I think it was about 107 bucks plus 30 bucks shipping and handling from the Philippines. You know, I really wanted a manual choke. It said it was all jetted, but the range it said it was jetted for was between the 550 and 650. So it ran way too lean on mine, coughing and sputtering and had a major dead spot. I think you'd probably just pull most of your jets out of here. I've been playing with some other jets I had in a rebuild kit, but I also realized that these motorcycle jets that I had kicking around, can't remember if they fit Keehan or Makuni. What was this carb? Makuni, so I had a little knockoff XR200 carb these fit in. There's a bunch of different jets in here. One other thing to know, I didn't have most of my vacuum stuff still hooked up. It was all been disconnected, so I just pulled this. It was like a, I think if you try to drive off when the vehicle is warm with your choke on, this would pull your choke off automatically with a vacuum temperature switch. So I just got rid of that. Simplified is good. Got it running yesterday pretty well playing around with some jets. And then all of a sudden I went to go drive it later in the day and it wouldn't idle at all. And I realized it was this kind of designed to not let your vehicle run on once you turn off the key. It shuts off fuel to your idle jet. That thing wasn't turning on activating. Yeah, a day of use on here. But keep in mind when I first bought my truck, it was idling super high because that thing was messed up as well. Someone turned up the idle super high. I have it pulled out right now. But mine I found that just actuated a bunch with 12 volts and put a new rubber o-ring in there helped. And that fixed my truck idling problem. So I think these are prone to issues. Now I took mine apart, pulled the end off of it, take off the brass end and there's a little spring and this that sits in there. I got rid of mine. One less electrical thing on here. Not everybody be into it. If that worked, I would have left it on, but it was super intermittent and I want my vehicle to idle. So before I put this back in, just a note, this port that's exposed right here, that is going to be your vacuum advance. I'm not sure what that was for some other accessory, but that's your air mixer screw right there. And that's the only vacuum line I have hooked up to this carb. Still got a few vacuum lines on here, but they're going from the manifold for vacuum switching, four wheel drive and stuff. Drill bits also work very well for plugging off the fuel lines because if you don't plug them off, they just kind of continuously drip. With this newer simplified carb without the four water lines, I can have the carb off in about 10 minutes. Before you'd have to drain your radiator to pull the carb, you'd have coolant leaking everywhere. And this is just such a simpler form. And uh, if you ever tune a carburetor, you know you got to take off the float wool quite a few times to make sure you get the jetting right. All right, so it's about mid 30s out in the morning and we're going to start this cold start. So we're going to pull on the choke and fire it off. Idle's great. It's uh, never worked this way since I've had the truck, so pretty happy about that. So we got side turn signals right on the side of the cab here, rear, but this bumper the previous owner put on never had turn signal mounts in it. The original bumper had turn signals down here. So these came with the truck. I'm about ready to drill them, put them in, probably somewhere like that. So lucky for me, she threw in the lights, the wiring loom to fit those, and the original turn signal wiring loom. So I'm going to cut this off and make sure these LEDs actually work on there. little predicament drilled my largest two and a half inch hole this drops in locks in but not very well it's pretty loose I think I need a two and a quarter I go from two and a half down to two and an eighth so I'm gonna have to go for two and eighth and take a die grinder and, uh, and grind it out until it fits I just don't want to have them loose and falling out So 
So now that we got the marker lights on here, another thing I wanna address while I'm up working on the front corners is I like the bumper the previous owner put on, nice winch. Um, it's a little on the heavy side, it fits the truck really well, but it left this corner of the cab pretty exposed for hitting sticks and brush and different things and debris on the sides of trails. And I just wanna protect this a little more. So I'm gonna take my tubing bender and bend some one inch tube, eighth inch wall and weld it right up into this area to kind of fill this out. So I'm pretty happy with the fitment of all of this. I think I'm gonna weld that on and paint it up. You guys hear some rocking on the drums it's my son he's playing drums in the shop so i've always had an exhaust leak down here and i tracked this gasket down for about 30 bucks in japan but they wanted like over 30 for shipping for a little gasket so i got some material i'm going to cut that with i'm going to change out the exhaust i modified it but i didn't have any one and a half inch at the time when i did it so i got one and a half inch tubing now so i'm going to redo this and this is where i had the exhaust it was a motorcycle 250 cc dirt bike exhaust over here but like i said i only had an inch and a quarter exhaust tubing so i got some inch and a half now i think this would be a good setup and because i don't want it to get any louder but i want a little more flow because i lost a little bit of top end power i got this resonator hopefully quiet it down a little bit previous owner had this thing they had a giant two inch exhaust sitting over here but it blew back towards the gas tank and it was just going to be really weird clearances so i ran the side pipe which i kind of like here with this nice aluminum and stainless canister can you throw some uh, can you throw some kick drum in there too Yep. So I just gotta recreate this out of inch and a half and hopefully fit this guy somewhere in there too. We'll see. So make sure to always disconnect your battery terminals before welding on a vehicle. I need to tack this exhaust in place before I can finish it up on the bench so I'll get all the angles right. I'm running this little Flux 135, just don't, don't have to drag a bottle around, which is nice. Welded basically all that at 75 and 80 amps. Worked pretty good. Not the most beautiful welds, but good enough. Good enough for what I need to do.
So here's the front of the radiator. I got rid of this tab mount here and this one. This is so I can install electric fan later on. Welded this on, this is gonna fit on the side of the original mounts. I doubled up the eighth inch aluminum back here inside for some thread mounts. So it's a little thicker quarter inch, welded that plate on. I got these pointing off at different angles here. This is kind of coming out this way. This one's going out the other way. It just lines up with the radiator hose a little better. Yeah, I'm gonna use these bottom stud mounts here. I drilled some little holes in the cross member of the Suzuki. Got some little O-ring kind of bushings I'm gonna put on down here. Should work pretty well. up this new car rejetted and timing and these uh, 23 inch tires on here I'm doing 56 down the highway right now and uh, maybe less than half throttle it does it no problem locking diff. This mud hole here just keeps kind of pulling my truck down into it. And uh, not much articulation in here, so it just kind of starts spinning. So he's going to pull me through. So got the trucks parked over here and uh, it's a cool spot. You wouldn't even really know this is here if you just came up on this hillside, but it's an old military bunker here. Another one, there's a lot of these around. Grown over and crusty, spray painted up. Pretty neat. Nature's taking over again.
So I'm really happy with this radiator I put in here. Probably looked over about 30 different radiators from Scirocco's to, what were those, MG's, Spitfire's, and just all kinds of different things, side-by-sides, and finally came up with this one. This is from a 650 side-by-side. -side. It has the same capacity, if not better. It's a cross flow, so it's divided in the center, so when the hot water comes into it, it has to force half the radiator is the top flow, and then it drops down and flows back to the bottom. And I still have the manual fan on here. That fan's gonna get deleted. I ordered a side-by-side -side radiator fan as well, so I'm going electric. And I should harness a few extra horsepower by not spinning that fan at five to 6,000 RPMs off the engine. Super simple. One other thing I need to do is relocate the uh, overflow catch tank right here because it's still in the original location, but it's a work in progress. I think just getting this radiator in here with less stuff around it, getting rid of that fan, and just that simple manual pull on that choke made this thing a lot more serviceable. It's finally getting really reliable and very easy to work on. The funny thing about these Japanese trucks, if you have like a 10, 12, 14, 17, and 19 millimeter wrench sockets and a screwdriver, you can basically do almost anything you need to on these things. It's super simple, this era of uh, early 90s Japanese technology. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. That truck is feeling a lot more reliable now. And, you know, I got about a thousand miles on it. I think from here on, it's going to be pretty solid. It's just starting running way better and pulling 55 to 60 down the highway now. Uh, mine has been taking a while to get the teething issues because the cooling system was basically just complete shit. But after that, you know, all this work I've done to it, I've actually fixed it up quite a bit. And he got his truck. I'm not sure if you guys have seen his video of buying this thing. He bought it from an importer. I'll put a link below in the description. It's my brother Andy. He also has a YouTube channel called Olympic Overland. Put a link to that below. He's got some mini truck content as well. And this thing's been pretty much solid. You had a few days worth of tinkering yeah, with it. Yeah, there was work. some stuff. It had a CV joint I needed to replace when I got it. But that we knew that within the first two minutes of being in the truck, you know, there was no hiding that one. And uh, tires were horrible when I got it. There were a few things I had to fix up on it, but it's always run pretty good. Yeah. It just seems to be getting better and better. I put a ton of miles. I probably got at least 2000 miles on it, maybe more than that at this point. Like we've run all over. I've hauled firewood with it. I've done a ton of stuff and it's, it's, it's working good. I've been really impressed. These things, this is an all wheel drive Honda. My truck has a high, low range transfer case. This thing has a lock and diff. Mine supposedly did from the factory, but it's not in it anymore. But I'm really sold on the all-wheel drive, man. Like this thing goes all over. It drives really smoothly, doesn't fight you. Like my truck in four high, it feels like it's fighting you on gravel roads. This thing just drives around smoothly. It really almost never gets stuck. Mine's almost comical how easy it can get stuck in two-wheel drive. And then you gotta shift it in a four and it's kind of a little dance you gotta do to get it back out of four-wheel drive by reversing and shifting it out as you're coming to a stop. But the Honda, man, I think this thing's the, uh, actually, you hear a lot of people claim that they're what, more for the street? Yeah, I was skeptical. So that's all I ever heard is that, okay, they're they're the better better commuter driver, daily driver style setup, but not good off-road. So when I went to go look at these trucks, I kind of, I actually drove this last, one of these trucks last. I just wasn't really that interested in them. And then when I drove it, I, I really liked the cab layout. Everything was good. And then I did some research and realized that the attack model had a locking rear differential, ultra low first gear, ultra low reverse gear. So it basically turns that standard four speed, but with those extra two gears, it's almost like it's like a six speed transmission at that yeah, point. So really combined well. with the locking diff, uh, the truck's gone everywhere I've needed to do to go. It, it did great in the snow this year. It's pulled me out today. Yeah, it pulled, <laughs> pulled Michael out. Although if you had that locking diff, it wouldn't yeah. have, your truck would have just gone through. Cause these, both of these trucks get very similar traction off road. We have similar lifts, uh, exact same tires, very comparable. If his had a locking diff still. For sure. yeah. Well, thanks for checking out the video. And like I said, check out Olympic Overland's channel. He's going to be putting up more content on this. Has a few mini truck videos up already. So thanks for watching. Till next time. Bye. I'm also going to say one last thing. Yeah, what's that? Uh, your truck, even though I have a locking <laughs> differential and the tire setups and everything, sometimes it just boils down to driving because I've seen him take his truck through some stuff that I couldn't actually get through. I gave up too soon, but... Uh, so I've seen your techniques on some stuff and you'll, you'll use speed and, uh, and, uh, and picking a good line, but <laughs> I still seen you get up and over a few things that I, that I kind of, I threw in the towel on. So, uh, even with the locking diff, cause my diff lock only works in the ultra low range. So until I bypass that technique and, uh, and picking a good line is still, you can still get through some stuff. So, <laughs> all right. Thanks for watching. Bye.